So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to be talking about the work that we've carried out trying to understand the origins of the commonest psychiatric disease, major depression. And I'll start by giving you an overview of why I think a lot of you should be studying, researching into depression. Then I'll describe the results from the study that we've carried out, uh, a study carried out in China, and some of the implications for the biological understanding of that condition. And I'm going to start by answering these four questions. How common is depression? How disabling is it? How effective are treatments? And how much is spent on research into the origins of depression? So firstly, how common is depression? Well, we have a lot of information from good epidemiological studies that tells us that one in five women in this room would experience one episode of major depression in their lifetime. Rates are a little lower in men, about one in eight or one in nine. But there's no argument this is a very common condition. Just because something's common, however, doesn't mean it's particularly serious. Many people get coughs and colds, which is an illness, but doesn't mean you can't get into work. So we need some indication of disability. How much does it actually stop you doing stuff, and how disabling is it? And the standard measure of this that epidemiologists use is called a disability-adjusted life year. And I'm going to show you one slide that summarizes a lot of work uh, indicating how um, disabling depression is. So here are data from the World Health Organization, and each dot on this graph represents results from one disease. The vertical axis is the, is the measure of disability, and I put a big red arrow to indicate that depression is the third commonest cause of disability in the world. These data are from 2013. The prediction is that by 2020, depression is going to occupy the top position. So it's clearly a disabling condition. The third question, how effective are our treatments? So again, I'll just show you one piece of data to make this point. This is a summary of many antidepressant studies, a meta-analysis. And from this, you can see that I would expect about half my patients to get better with treatment after about three months. Now, that sounds pretty good, but of course, the comparison here should be with what if I didn't give them an antidepressant? So if I put in, by comparison, the placebo rates, you'll see this is about 40%. So the increment is pretty small. We don't do a very good job with current antidepressants in curing our patients. So given that this is common, this is disabling, and that we don't really treat our patients very well, you would have thought that quite a lot of work would be going on to try and understand the origins of depression and improve the situation. And again, I'll just show you one slide to show that's not the case. So this is a summary uh, pie chart showing money from NIH funding. And the proportion of the circle that's occupied is relative to the amount of disability. And you can see that uh, AIDS occupies top position here. And just two up from AIDS, you'll see a small sliver which represents depression. And clearly, that's not commensurate with the slide I showed you before, which indicated the amount of disability across the world. In other words, relative to disability, our funding of depression is really meager. So it's common, it's disabling, we don't treat it very well, and we don't spend much money on research. So given that sort of situation, I think most of us would agree that if we're going to make any progress, we've got to understand what are the causes of the depression. If we're going to have more effective therapies, I need to know why people get depressed and why they keep getting depressed. This is a recurrent condition. In the most general sense, there are two causes. There are environmental causes, bad things happening to you. I'll talk a bit about that later. And there are genetic causes. We've a lot of work so far on the environmental causes. We know some stuff, but not enough that's really helped us towards devising new therapies. What about the genetic causes? Again, I'll summarize basically a couple of slides showing you the, until a couple of years ago at least, the world's uh, attempt. This is a, a, a study carried out taking samples from about 20 groups across the world uh, using a genetic technique 
to identify regions of the genome that might be associated with depression, and this is the result. So for those of you not familiar with this, this type of um, uh, uh, picture, um, the bottom of the uh, slide represents the chromosomes, the horizontal axis of the chromosomes, and the vertical axis is the likelihood of association. And every single dot there represents the results from a section of the genome. And there's a red line at the top which represents the significance level. And in order for us to declare we found something in the genome, we need one of those gray dots to exceed the red line. And none of it, none of them do. So that was with a study of about 9,000 patients and 9,000 controls, uh, and nothing was found. So that leads me to address my next question, why has it been so difficult to find the genetic basis of depression? And I can think of three possible answers. One is because it's a psychiatric disease, and we all know psychiatric diseases are difficult to study. I'll give you one nice slide to show that's not the case. It's a piece of work that was referred to in the introduction a little earlier, which is the genetic analysis of schizophrenia. And here is another of those genome-wide association uh, slide pictures. Again, chromosomes on the bottom, likelihood on the, uh, on the vertical axis. And you can see the red line now is dwarfed by, in this case, 108 positions in the genome, which exceeds significance. So this is for schizophrenia, clearly a psychiatric disease, and genetic approaches do work. So just because something's a psychiatric disease doesn't mean you can't tackle it with a genome-wide association approach. Second possibility might be that depression isn't very heritable. Perhaps it's not really going to be appropriate for these genetic approaches. Let me show you the data on this. This is a summary of twin studies, um, good quality twin studies. So seven, six of these. And at the bottom, you can see they're summarized by uh, two little uh, uh, vertical lines uh, with short horizontal lines indicating that the confidence intervals are very tight. And that tells us that the heritability of depression is about 37%. That's about the same as diabetes, a condition which has been very successively taken apart with genetic approaches. So there is no reason why the heritability here is not sufficient to stop us taking a genetic approach. So that explanation doesn't hold. The third reason, and I'm going to go into this in a bit more detail, is because maybe depression is not one disease. Maybe it's like cancer. Before we knew there were different forms of cancer. Maybe by just taking people with depression, we're conflating a whole series of different conditions. So let me run through some evidence to suggest that it is uh, more than one disease. And I'm going to start with a, a, a picture of the correlations between the phenotypic, uh, the classification. So to make a diagnosis of depression, I have to ask you questions to elicit nine clinical criteria. If we're dealing with a single condition, then you might expect there to be a degree of correlation between those answers from a group of patients. And moreover, that should represent some underlying trait, some latent trait, the disease. And if you do that, you get a picture that looks something like this. So these axes represent the nine clinical criteria. On the uh, horizontal and, uh, axes uh, are the correlations, and the vertical bars there represent the correlation with an underlying latent trait. And if there was a single effect there, that should all group together, or if there were two, there should be two peaks, and you can see it's a mess. So symptomatically, this doesn't really cohere. But what about at a more biological level? Well, here are some data again from twin studies. The uh, red and blue represent the heritabilities for men and women. Vertical axis here is uh, percent. And I'm showing you this because of the green bars. These are the genetic correlations between men and women. If the same genetic variants made men and women depressed, then the correlation should be 1, 100%. And you can see that in both of those studies, that's not the case. It's about 55%. So that tells us at the genetic level, we're dealing with, us with different conditions. I'm now going to show you two other slides which are slightly more complicated. They're also derived from twin studies, and they're again addressing this question of whether we're dealing with one condition or, or many. So don't be too frightened by this. I'll talk you through it. What you're seeing here is an attempt to deconvolve the genetic contributions 
uh, to the nine symptomatic criteria. So the boxes where it says mood, anhedonia, weight, appetite, they're the symptomatic criteria for depression. And the uh, three blobs at the top represent common uh, genetic factors, and the ones at the bottom where it says AS are specific factors. Each of the lines carries a number, which is uh, a measure of the weight of those effects. And the overall message you can get from this is that there is not one single thing dominating. If there was one common genetic underlying factor, there should be one round box at the top, and there's not. There are three. The best fitting model in this case indicates that there are three latent genetic components, not a single one. And we can turn this question around and say, OK, so this doesn't seem to be a single thing contributing to uh, the, the construct of depression. But how does depression relate to other conditions? Maybe it separates out and it's a clear separate entity. And we know that's not true either. So this figure, similar structure, now shows in the middle, in those boxes, seven different diseases. Major depressions on the left, then there's generalized anxiety disorder, and a series of other conditions. And what we're seeing again is at the bottom, specific genetic effects, and from the top, things that are shared. Now, if major depression was a coherent genetic unity, then what we should see is a, as a specific effect, written down there um, as that number in the left-hand uh, bottom circle, that should be a large big number. It's zero. In fact, there are no specific genetic effects of depression. Everything is shared. So again, at this level, we can't say we're dealing with one disorder. Let me turn finally to give you an example from the environmental perspective. Remember, I'm telling you that there are two forms of uh, causes here, genetic and environmental. So most of us are familiar with this. We send off our life's work, our greatest piece of science to nature, and next day they send it back. We're not even going to send it out to review. For scientists, this is a stressful life event, and you feel a little unhappy when that happens to you. And we know from a lot of work that there's a very close temporal relationship between a stressful life event and an, a production, and a piece, and a, and a, uh, uh, an episode of major depression. That occurs within about three months. That's to say, if you come to see me, you're very depressed, and I ask what happened, and you say, oh, last year nature rejected my paper. I know from a lot of evidence that that is not the cause of your depression. The temporal relationship is not consistent with that pattern. But there's one type of life event that doesn't fit that pattern, and that is childhood abuse, particularly childhood sexual abuse, the single largest cause in terms of its odds ratio for major depression. If that happens to you, multiple episodes of depression throughout your life. So that's ending up with the same clinical phenotype, but from very different starting points, different causes. So I've summarized a lot of data, all really making the same point, that we're not dealing here with one condition. It is complicated, very complicated. And because of that, I spent a lot of time talking with my friend Ken Kendler to design something we call the Converge Study. And the idea here was to eliminate as much as we could of the sources of heterogeneity and collect as much information as we can for those sources of heterogeneity we could not exclude, at least to include them. And you'll see how important that is later on. So we set out to collect 6,000 cases and 6,000 controls. At that stage, this was planned seven years ago, a very large study. Women only. Men and women are different, and they get depressed for different reasons. It's not the same condition. It's important that we study these things separately, or at least power our studies appropriately to take this into account. We look at recurrent depression. Again, evidence suggesting that recurrent and single episode have different components. And then we collect, as I said, a lot of information about potential risk factors. So we need a very large population to do this in. Um, we need a place where there's very good health system. And we went to China. And myself and Ken traveled over there. Uh, we would um, train doctors in how to assess depression. We'd give them these laptops. We used uh, computer-based interviews. 10% of all of our interviews uh, were edited. We recorded about 80% of them. And uh, we made pretty sure that we had 
as high quality data as, as I think any group in the world has been able to collect. And we started in August 2008 in Shanghai, and four years later, we completed the study. This slide summarizes uh, quite a lot of my life in many ways. I learned a lot from it. Uh, and just a little, uh, uh, little anecdote here that you might know, which I didn't. You'll notice on the black line, which is the, the cases, that there are little horizontal lines occasionally. And they occur at regular intervals. These represent Chinese holidays. The world's largest country completely shuts down for about two weeks of the year, and no patients could be collected during that period of time. Uh, it's quite remarkable. So we'd done this uh, study, and in order to do so, it involves really spending a lot of time in psychiatric hospitals by me. I've been to more psychiatric hospitals in China, I think, than anyone on the planet. Uh, these are the places that were involved in our study. There are 30 hospitals, uh, 30 cities and 60 hospitals. And just to give you a vignette of what it's like, uh, I would start off, this is one of the first hospitals I visited, uh, and visit hospital after hospital after hospital after hospital. And you can see it's a slightly tiring enterprise. <laughs> and at the end of that, when we finished our sample collection, we took the DNA down to world's largest sequencing center, in uh, Shenzhen and asked them to help us. And they did something uh, after some discussion with us, which was slightly uh, unusual, which was we sequenced everybody. And sequencing 12,000 people at that stage uh, was a major undertaking. We generated more data, more sequence data than any other group had in the world. But we did it in a way that most people found a little unusual, which is we didn't collect complete sequence. So the few use next generation sequencing, you fractionate the genome randomly, and in order to get a good uh, estimate of what it's there, you have to sequence it many times, because you, you, you're just randomly sampling. So people normally go for at least 20x 20 co 20 coverage. Uh, we went for a coverage that looked like this, if you can see on the bottom, I've said that the uh, sequencing depth has uh, got a mean of about 1.7. So this wasn't exactly what most people regard as important. We can discuss why we took that strategy later. It's got some um, advantages and some disadvantages. The data we get back looks a bit like this. Uh, sort of, uh, sometimes we get two variants, sometimes one, sometimes nothing at all. And what we have to do is turn it into something that looks like that, where we can then carry out a genetic study. And to go from the bottom to the top takes about two years an awful lot of computational time, and um, then you end up with something you can use for an association study. And I'll just show you uh, one slide to indicate that it worked quite well, at least in terms of the accuracy. So I'm showing you our imputation accuracy. Imputation here is the term we use for working out what's missing in a data set and using, in this case, other people's data to fill in the holes. And I'm showing you on the uh, horizontal axis the allele frequency. and for most of these studies, we need alleles with a frequency greater than 5%. Uh, and if you look, you can just about work out that we're, we're really in the greater than 90, 95, and up to 98% range when, we, uh, when, we're, when we're looking at common variants. Things which are very rare we don't too, do too well at, which is sort of expected. But we're not too concerned about that because we really want to get all of the common variants. Okay, so a lot of time spent carefully collecting the phenotypes, a lot of time getting a lot of sequence data. What did we find? So I'll show you our results, and it'll be in exactly the same format as you've seen before. Here is the, the result we got, and now you can see that the little red line is exceeded in two positions. Uh, so we did better than everyone else. And uh, I'll just show you what's underneath those two peaks. They're both on chromosome 10, so we're going to zoom in now. This is. Uh, one of them, and you can see the peak lies between a gene uh, n named there as CERT1, that's a CERT CERTUIN, it's an NAD plus um, his histone acetylase, and there's a, a gene to the other side, DNA GSA12, which is a, a heat shock protein. Neither of those have been implicated in depression uh, before, in fact, uh, um, none of the stuff we found uh, is is, is known, and this is the second locus. This lies in an intron of a gene with a very long name, which I can never remember, so I've written it at the bottom of the slide. 
again, a gene of uh, an unknown function. So that's, that's good. That's uh, uh, impressive we've got so far. But um, no human geneticist will believe these results unless we can replicate them, ideally in an independent sample. So I made two new friends, and uh, Xu Qi and Yin Chan here, as you can see. And they fortunately had got a sample, not as big or as well characterized, of course, as ours, but they had a sample. And we um, set out to replicate them. So let me show you our results. There's a, there are two markers there. Those RS numbers are positions in the genome. And um, note the odds ratio there. That's the effect size attributable to this locus. And then there's a p-value in the far left. And then we take these two markers and we ask, do we see the same effect in our colleague's sample? And that's given in the middle section of this slide. Their replication sample is smaller than ours, but you can see that both those p-values are, are, are reasonable. And then we give a summary at the far right-hand side when we combine all of the data. So that's enough to keep the human geneticists happy that we've actually found something. But I think it raises um, an important question, which is why were we successful? Why did we manage and others didn't? And I think you can appreciate what my answer might be from how I've introduced this study. And I'm going to give you just two vignettes to indicate that getting a phenotype and understanding the phenotype in this condition is very important. So the two reasons that I'm going to go through are we're dealing with a severe illness in, in, in China. And secondly, I'll tell you a little bit about looking at the, what I'll call the reduced effect of the environment. And I'll, I'll define that in a moment. But let's deal with the first of these. Getting into hospital for a psychiatric disease in most places in the world is, is pretty unpleasant. It's not something most of us ever want to do. It's particularly difficult in China. There's much more of a barrier. The stigma is higher. And as a consequence, most of the people we include in our study are more severely depressed than you'll get elsewhere in the world. And one measure of that are the rates of a subtype of depression with a very old-fashioned name, melancholia. These are the clinical criteria that we use to um, define melancholia. High rates of comorbidity, those are the anxiety disorders and so on I showed you earlier. More episodes. Lower rates of stressful life events consistent with it having a more biological origin. And greater genetic propensity. Fully 85% of our sample met this diagnosis. And for comparison, most other studies who've tried to find recurrent major depression are lucky if they find more than 10%. So this is a severely ill group. Now, if I'm right that including this sample increased our chance of the success, then one thing we could do is just analyze the people with melancholia. So just concentrate on the very depressed people, those with men melancholia. This means reducing the sample, which in most cases, of course, should reduce power. But what do we see? So this is the result of mapping just this very form, very severe form of depression, melancholia. And you can see there's a, a, a nice red blob there. And just to show you a comparison, so on the left, I'm showing you the results from, from melancholia where we've got 4,500 cases, on, and on the right here, the results from depression, about 5,000 cases. And you can see that the, the peak is higher. Is that significantly higher? We can test that hypothesis in a simple way. We take the samples on the right-hand side, those with major depression, and we randomly select the same number. That's the 4,509. And we reanalyze and do that lots and lots of times. And each time, we, we report back the effect size, the odds ratio. And then we see whether what we saw in the real cases of melancholia, rather than the randomly sampled ones, whether the effect size is what we'd expect to occur by chance. So I'm showing you that in this, in this slide here. So the, the blue represents this, these results from the randomly sampled 4,500 cases. The red line is the result we get from the real data. And then we can work out the significance by just looking at its position on this distribution. And I report the p-value back there as 0.012. So yes, there is a significant enrichment using that approach. The second thing I was telling you about was uh, what I call the reduced effect of the environment. I'll deal with one particular environmental cause, one I've mentioned, which is childhood sexual abuse. And I told you this is a severe, very severe cause of depression. It's not easy to get this information. 
you have to ask the questions I put up there. There's some issues about how much people tell you, but we did collect this information. And because we asked these very specific questions, we're able to categorize it into different forms. So no abuse, moderate, mild, or severe. So here's a summary of, of those data. And I'm showing you, uh, importantly, the OR. That's the odds ratio. So if you have the most severe form of depression, you have a more than tenfold increased chance of getting episodes of depression. And as I said to you, that's a lifelong risk. What's important about the odds ratios is that they increase depending on severity. A very good indication that what we're dealing with here is causal, but environmentally causal. So just imagine we've got a genetic study, and amongst that group, we have those who have suffered depression because of an environmental cause. Those are the numbers involved, not a very big big sample, about 600 people altogether. So what happens, what would you expect to happen if I take that out from my sample and reanalyze? My, my, our argument was that if we've got a primarily genetic signal, then taking out the diluted dilution effect of an environmental cause should increase the genetic signal. And that's exactly what you can see in this slide. So now there are not two, there are in fact three peaks and we can do the same trick we did before and ask whether there's an enrichment. So again, I'll do this subsampling trick. Let me just, before I do so, though, just zoom in on that, the, that peak on chromosome 8 to show you what's there. This is a, a, a solute carrier. This is a, actually something called mitoferrin, transferring iron into the mitochondria. Unexpected finding there. But now let's move on to see this, this enrichment story, and I'll show you the same picture as I showed you before. There's, these are the three peaks, the three uh, round uh, blue peaks here represent the distributions, and the red line, again, the real observation. Uh, so for, on the left-hand side, it's the chromosome 10 for the CERT1 locus. The one in the middle is the LHPP, and the right-hand side is the chromosome 8 locus. So you can see we get a significant enrichment at two loci, but not at the third. So that tells us that the loci may be behaving differently, and it's a first hint about something that many people talk about, but I think the evidence for which has not been robustly shown, that we're seeing environmentally determined effects on the genetics, or to use another term, a gene-by-environment interaction. Now, I want to finish by just going back to something that emerges when you use sequence data. And I told you that we got complete genome sequence, but I told you also, going back to this slide, that our coverage is incomplete. However, one part of the genome we do collect in great detail, and that's the genome that resides within the mitochondrion. Although we only get a, about 2x coverage on the nuclear genome, on the mitochondrion genome we get about 100x coverage, and that allows us to get a pretty good idea of what's going on. Not a bit of the genome that most people are interested, particularly for psychiatric conditions, I have to say. But we made a rather unexpected observation. What you're seeing here are measures of the amount of mitochondrial DNA normalized for the nuclear DNA, in our cases in controls. And there's a significant, a highly significant difference between those two. It's not a big difference, 1.3 or so, but it's highly significant. One thing I didn't tell you is that we collect our DNA from the saliva of our patients. So when we found this, there were a lot of explanations that we considered. Maybe the mouth has dried out. Maybe there's some infection. Who knows? So we consider these one at a time. The obvious one is it might be a drug effect, for example. We could rule out partly because a relatively large proportion of our population were not receiving standard antidepressants. They were taking various forms of traditional Chinese medicine. We could see no difference between those who did and didn't receive these treatments. And also because I, because I would do mouse genetics, we treated mice with various forms of antidepressants and couldn't replicate this. So a drug effect we don't think. A more possible explanation is we've got a change in the cellular composition of the saliva. Saliva is mostly white cells and a bit of um, epithelium. Maybe there's a bit more of neutrophils. Maybe the T-cell composition changes. It wouldn't have to be a big change to see this. 
So how can we get at that? And the way we decided to do this was looking at the methylation state of a, propor a proportion of our sample. Now, methylation is a very expensive assay to do. We couldn't do the entire set. So what we did was we took the extremes of our distribution, a couple of hundred people, high and low on the uh, mitochondrial DNA score, and we looked at a number of different sites which would indicate the cellular composition. And I'm showing you here the um, uh, measures of the uh, uh, blood cellular type. These are CPG, uh, these are methylation states in, in, um, in blood and of buccal epithelium. And on the left here are the cases and on the right are the controls. And you can see there's a slight difference in the distribution of these, of these patterns of yellow and, and blue. But in fact, it's, um, it turns out uh, not to be significant. But we're trying to answer the question whether this contributes to the difference in mitochondrial DNA. So what we do is we take these results, we quantify them, and then we ask to what extent do the differences we observe in the methylation state explain the mitochondrial DNA. And remember, the methylation state here is a proxy for cellular composition. And I'll show you next the results of residualizing that on the left is uh, the mitochondrial DNA main effects. This is different from what I showed you before because we're looking at a subset of our cases, so the effect is bigger here. And on the right, I've residualized, taken out the effect of the mitochondrial, uh, sorry, of the, uh, of the methylation state, and you can see that the effect remains. So this convinced us that we weren't dealing with something due to the cellular composition. So what else might be going on? We had a clue, which was that there seemed to be an effect of stress going back again to the environment on the amount of DNA. So I've told you quite a lot already about childhood sexual abuse, and what you're seeing here, that's the vertical axis is again a measure of the amount of mitochondrial DNA, and I've laid out the, the, uh, the, the, the four categories, no CSA, the uh, moderate, uh, mild, moderate, and, uh, and severe forms of, of childhood sexual abuse. And you can see, again, there's a, there's an, there's differences between no CSA and CSA, and again, an, uh, a gradual increment consistent with this being uh, causally related. It increases if, with, the, some, with the more severe forms. So that suggested an interesting hypothesis that maybe stress had an effect on this. And uh, I do, as I've said, mouse genetics. So an obvious thing for us to do was to test this hypothesis. We couldn't do it in people, but we could do it in mice. How would you stress mice? Had to be chronic. Doing sexual abuse in mice wasn't going to work, but maybe something that sort of persisted over time would do. So we use what in fact is a fairly standard uh, approach, which is you drop the mice into a bucket of water on one day, the next day you give them a mild foot shock, the day after that you stuff them into a small container so they can't move, then you keep them awake all night, and after that the graduate student needs to go home because he needs a break. So there's a stress, chronic stress regime that we introduced, and we did this for four weeks, and let me show you the results. So again, vertical axis is a measure of the amount of, uh, of mitochondrial DNA, and this is over four weeks. The red is the stressed and the blue is the non-stressed, and you can see you get a gradual increment over time, it becomes highly significant after four weeks, and then at the end there are two blocks marked eight, and they this, there is no difference between the two, and that's because we left the animals for four weeks without stressing them. So that tells us two things. It tells us that there is a relationship between stress and mitochondrial DNA, and it tells us, secondly, that this is dynamic, that it'll go back again. It's not permanent. So we've puzzled about this a lot. Um, I'm a geneticist, so I tend to think of these things in genetic ways. And an obvious thing to do was to ask, well, maybe they share genetic roots. Maybe this is in some way telling us something about the origins of depression. So I do the obvious genetics thing, which is to map what contributes to the amount of mitochondrial DNA. Here are the results. Again, a, 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 a chromosomes laid out, significance on the vertical axis, and two very clear peaks. One on uh, chromosome 7 and one on 10. 10, of course, is where we found two laso before, so we immediately thought, well, maybe this, is, uh, maybe this is it. Maybe this is what's contributing. It's either the CERT or the uh, LHPP locus. Turned out not to be the case. Um, this is uh, uh, the position on chromosome 10, and, and actually it's over TFAM. And it's, in fact, over the lead sequence of TFAM. TFAM 
transcription factor A for mitochondria. Guess what that does? So that was uh, consoling in the sense it tells us we're probably getting the right thing, but told us nothing about the origins of depression. What about the other one? Well, that was a cyclin-dependent kinase, not related to depression. We could see no signal here that correlated between the two. So that really hasn't got us very far. It suggests that this is not on the causal pathway, but what exactly it's doing, we don't know. So I'll turn to the last couple of slides to um, address something which I think is important when you deal with these questions, which is really looking at this longitudinally. Geneticists always think about things at one point. We're interested in lifetime measures. And we don't really follow people up very much. There's beginning to be a change over this. It's, as you'll see, I think very important for understanding, particularly a condition like depression, which is recurrent. I want to know not just why you fell ill, but why you did it again and again and again. And I want to stop that happening. So in this case, we're asking, does this biochemical measure of mitochondrial DNA, does it somehow relate to how, how often you get depressed? Is it is an indication of whether you're getting better or not? So we need longitudinal data to answer this. We don't have this from, a, from our genetic study, so I had to find a collaborator, in this case a group in Germany, who had. And what they have is a, a study running for eight weeks where they bring patients in and they criteria for getting in is this HAMD, a Hamilton D score. It's a symptomatic measure of how miserable you are. And you can see at week naught there, they've identified people with, a, with, a, with high uh, HAMD scores, and then they follow them up over, over time, and as you'd expect, it drops as they get treated. And at the bottom, there's some there, is, there are some controls. So our prediction was that the mitochondrial DNA might track, and we... Uh, were able to extract DNA that the German group had collected. They'd sampled in a very assiduous way, weekly. And this is what we find. So the red lines are the cases, the blues are the controls. And you can see it's not looking at all like the uh, measures that we showed you for the, um, for the mood. It's, in fact, it's at the very beginning when the Hamilton scores are very high, the controls and the uh, cases are not significantly different. Those little grey dots you can see represent the p-values of the difference between the weekly measures. It becomes significant by about week four. There's a gradual increase, as you can see. And the other thing you can see, though it's not sort of totally robust, is it begins to drop towards the end. So there's sort of curvy linear here. Just to show you that over uh, uh, in relationship to the Hamilton scores, I'm repeating this graph. So the top one is the symptomatic measure, and the bottom one is the mitochondrial DNA. And you can see that they don't track. In the middle, I've showed you the overall correlation. So these are highly correlated over the eight weeks. So we could use the mitochondrial DNA to indicate the mood, but that's over the eight-week period. The thing we're really interested in, though, is would it help me clinically at a particular time point? So my last slide, I'm just going to show you the same thing, but now just looking at the single time point, and I'll show you the correlations between the two. So the vertical axis on the left indicates the correlation coefficient, and the one on the right is the p-value. And you can see it's all over the shop. There really isn't anything significant going on here within a single week. I have no idea what this means. I'm presenting this to you as far as we've got with this particular story. Uh, there's clearly a lot of information we can pull out of biological measures. But at this stage, just to uh, repeat something you heard, heard earlier, this is a research goldmine. There's tons of stuff going on here that needs looking at. And there are not enough people in this field really moving into it to explore. And I really think it's time that you stop doing what you were doing and go and work on depression. It's a really important subject. So just to summarize, we found two loci that contribute to major depression at, uh, and melancholia. Uh, we found that a severe form of depression, melancholia, has an increased genetic signal at one locus, and that the removal of a severe environmental determinant increases the genetic signal. And I've shown you, but not explained why, that cases have an increased amount of mitochondrial DNA. And I want to finish by thanking the Converge Consortium, the group of hospitals in China that made this possible, and my colleagues in Oxford, in particular Dai Na, who was the Chinese student, actually an A-star graduate, who's worked on this project for the last three years. Thank you very much. <laughs>